All right, we have Robert Michael from the House of Marcus back uh, on the podcast. And uh, yeah, that's funny, just like you were one of my first guests, I think, probably in the first few episodes uh, of the show. I don't remember what episode, but one of the one of the low numbers. Um, so uh, glad to have you back. We had a great chat last time. I think we went into like all kinds of religious stuff. <laughs> and that was that was a lot of fun for me. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think a lot a lot has happened <laughs> since. Right. Especially in your oh, life. Yeah. yeah. What's uh, what's been going on with you? I know you had like uh, recently a a crazy experience. You probably you probably talked about it uh, ad nauseum at this point. Right. <laughs> Oh, the, my Kansas experience with my yeah. arrest was that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that the it actually took place last year, of course, last uh, June uh, when we were driving through Kansas on our way to Wichita, and I got yeah. pulled over. You know, and of course, uh, the officer wants your license and registration. And but the first thing he said to me was, you know, can you follow me down the road so I can go catch the other guy too, just to be fair. And I was like, wait a minute, what is that in the course of your official duties, like? This kind of seems like revenue collection to me, right? Yeah. And of course, I, I know that it's all revenue collection, right? It's not about yeah. breaking any law. I mean, going over right. the speed limit. To break a law, you got to hurt somebody or injure somebody, technically. I mean, that's yeah. really what breaking the law is with the intent to do. That's a crime, right? But traffic's all quasi pseudo crime. It's not crime at all. Um, so it's all commercial. And I've learned that over the years. So I just decided to say you know what not today man not today i'm not going to give you that information <laughs> actually i'll show you the card yeah i got one see then i held it up to the window and i put it back down and i said but i'm not going to give you any other information because i'm not free to go unless i'm free to go am i free to go said, no you're not okay well am i under arrest no okay well then there's no other reason for this interaction right now than for you to investigate something right you're asking me questions that I really don't have to give you an answer to. So I'm just going to go ahead and take the fifth on that and say, sorry, I don't have counsel. So I'm not giving you any information. All right. Now, I know that I have the license. So I knew at some point, you know, they're going to go, oh, you got the contract here, you know, the license and all. But that's OK. I just was pushing it to see where it was going to go um, in the moment. All right. So it wound up leading to an arrest. There was like seven officers out there. You know, they broke the window, all this stuff, you know. But they wouldn't identify. Well, they did finally, but they wouldn't identify themselves at first. You know, they're calling me sovereign citizen, even though I didn't really hear that. But once I saw the evidence that they gave me, which was their car cam, they didn't have body cams, by the way. We, we recorded mm. everything. But on the car cam, that's all the guy kept saying. It was a sovereign citizen here. I think he's trying to escalate this. I think he's trying to escalate this. And I'm thinking after I saw the evidence video, I laughed. I'm like trying to escalate it. All I did was say, dude, I can't give you any information. You're going to have to figure something out here. You know, you're the one that called seven other police officers. Like, what are you talking about? Oh, it was such a joke. But anyway, so that all went on last year. Yeah. They gave me excessive bail and bonds. So what I kept doing was tracking like every single violation of my rights that they had done. But I just kept going, all right, signing everything without prejudice and uh, under duress the whole time which reserves my rights under contract plus also says it's under threat the rest of the contracts null and void so i kept doing that um i filed all my paperwork and everything into the court like before i even had the quote unquote arraignment so they arrested me they gave me three weeks till this arraignment put me on bond whatever so i you know put all my paperwork in and um you know they ran right over that which they typically do that's mm -hmm. fine so then they go to we're going to go to trial now right which, by the way, I didn't even I didn't argue the charges at arraignment. I said, I'm not pleading guilty or not guilty. I, I'm not pleading anything. I don't plead anyone but God. And quite honestly, I accept all the charges. It's not a problem. Yeah, I accept that. Well, we need you to plead. I'm like, but you don't you're, you're not hearing what I'm saying. You're giving me charges. I'm accepting them. Whether you call it pleading or not is up to you. You know, so the judge takes power of attorney, basically, and fills out that I'm pleading not guilty. Well, anyone that does that for you, that's I don't care, you know, what statute you're using or, or not. That's a power of attorney. You cannot take that right yeah. from me without me appointing you to do so. But he did. 
And then he said, well, I'll note that, you know, I'll note that you don't consent to this on, on the, I'm like, okay. So this Pretty is a magistrate anyway. now, which, yeah, which is lower than a judge. I okay. know. So, um, but regardless, then he admitted that my bond was too excessive, right? So now I'm being held on excessive bail on bond, which is a constitutional violation as well. And um, so he reduced it, you know, so I could go home and not stay in the state, which was a joke, right? I'm like, dude, it's, I refused to give you my information. Why is that such a high bond? I don't have any criminal record. That's ridiculous. I could see if I had past crime or whatever, but I didn't, I did nothing. Mm -hmm. So anyway, they did that. And then, um, all right, we're going to trial. Well, they scheduled my trial for 300 days later, a little over 300 days later, which in Kansas, the right to speedy trial is 180 days. So I challenged that and said, well, you know, my right speed. Now I knew what they were going to do. Well, since COVID, and that's exactly what they did. So again, what I have now is the court admitting that when we're in an emergency, we can do away with your constitutional rights. So a lot of people argue that online, right? They're like, oh, that's not true. You know, they can't just, you know, do away with your constitutional rights because of an emergency. And they do it all the time. Well, yeah, I had a question about that, too, because I, I think I commented on one of your posts because you, you said something about the Constitution being suspended. And I mean, I was kind of curious about that. Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. I, I mean, remember. yeah, they I mean, it's certainly not written anywhere that they can do that. Right. So how is that? Well, it is. It's in their executive orders. OK, once they started executive orders with Lincoln back at, um, I think, executive order 100. Uh, once he started those executive orders, remember that formed the dictatorship. He took, yeah, technically, yes, you're correct. They, yeah. They're not supposed to do that. But Lincoln started that whole thing, okay, okay. and with the emergency war powers, and then emer and so they went with war and emergency mm -hmm. later down the down the road. And if you read, um, actually, I don't know if I have a. Let me see if I have anything open here. No, I'd have to pull it up. But there's um, a congressional committee and a senate report from 1973 that explains this that okay. says most people have lived their entire lives and their children and you know even their grandparents um under war and uh, under emergency powers and don't even know it specifically from 1933 the emergency bank relief act now that's only 40 years later in 73 but what they were saying is we are still under that emergency and as long as they keep renewing an emergency where they don't end the emergency, they can do whatever they want because they're acting in an emergency capacity. So that's a, so, an old act you said that's been passed on. Senate report. You can Google 19, just Google 1973 Senate report uh, emergency powers and okay. it should pull it up. I can give it to you when we're done too. I just have to okay. look it up real quick. That's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? right. Now, that was 1973. I mean, we're 50 years from that. Right. But still, you know, it still holds true. Like they're still doing that. And she admitted it by saying, oh, well, we don't have to give you your constitutional right to speedy trial because we're in an emergency. So, again, caught the judge in that. Right. Now, that was my pretrial, plus a lot of other things that happened. I could go into it. We'd be here for, you know, an hour and a half just explaining this thing. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is I knew that they were going to convict me and I wasn't doing it to use one of these patriot processes to hurry up and get rid of this case. That wasn't the point. I was actually doing it to expand this case, catching them in everything. I mean, dude, I had to do my own trial because I don't use attorneys. Mm -hmm. I've never done a trial before. Now, granted, it was only a misdemeanor. So there wasn't a whole lot of stake here. Well, there was one year in jail that they could have gave me maximum. Yeah. Yeah. But that was the biggest stake, right? So I'm like, well, all right, well, I'm going to do this trial. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to, you know, follow the rules. Now, I was, I mean, I'm not a trial lawyer, so I got to like Google everything on my phone while we're, while we're going along to make sure that I'm following the rules and what my, you know, what the rules are for me to be able to, to handle this case. So um, I cross-examined all the police and then I re-examined the police um, and I asked them, I said, how many, you know, years of training have you had? 22 weeks. So none of them had any more than 22 weeks. And some of them had as low as 18 weeks of training. And I said, okay, well, how much of that were you taught a law? 
Oh, uh, well, we learned some law a little bit. They all tried to like answer me without giving me an answer, right? Which the judge, of course, allows. So in other words, like, oh yeah, yeah, we've had constitutional training. Okay, well, how much constitutional training? Well, I don't know, I can't recall. Well, they, they just skirted it, right? Yeah. Um, well, do, do you remember anything about your constitutional education that you had? Well, uh, well, yeah, we were taught the Fifth Amendment and the Fourth. I said, great, can you tell me what both of those mean? And I mean, you want to talk about deer in the headlights. These guys were like <laughs> sweating bullets, man. They couldn't even, they, they couldn't. Now, a few of them could who had been officers long enough, right? There was one guy that was like an officer for like 30 some years. and Another guy that was like 15 or 20. They knew, but the other four or five didn't know. They couldn't even utter what each one of those amendments was about. Even the fifth? Everybody yeah, they could. The yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm like, can you tell me what, what it says? You know, oh, can you just tell me what it's about? Oh, uh, right to remain silent? Like, <laughs> are you asking me or telling me? Like, you know, I feel like I'm in grade school here. Yeah, wow. they did not know. And then, and I asked them all, do you have an oath of, of office? Yes, I do. So you took an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the state of Kansas and the Constitution of the United States. Which, mind you, remember, it's the Constitution of the United States, not the Constitution of the United States of America. Okay, it's different. But nonetheless, they took that oath because I looked it up in their statutes. So, yeah, yeah, I took that. Well, the one, the one guy was like, I took an oath to support the Constitution of the state of Kansas and the statutes of the state of Kansas. I said, and the Constitution of the United States. I took an oath to support the Constitution of the state of Kansas and the statutes of Kansas. He wouldn't say. And I said, Your Honor, he's avoiding the question. She's like, no, I think he answered your question. I'm like. No, he didn't answer the question. Did you take an oath to support the Constitution of the United States? Yes or no? You know, yeah. but, and, and this guy was real, like, he was the one that was just a complete ass out of, out of all. The guy that actually arrested me or actually pulled me over was probably one of the nicest out of them. And you could tell he was real sincere. And he was the one that gave me the charges, right? Because he <laughs> arrested me. Now, when they put him on the stand, they played his evidence video, which is his car camera. Okay. And 10 minutes in, he says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, that, that video just looped. That video just looped. And I was like, video looped. It's digital. Digital doesn't loop. It might glitch. It might stutter or something, but, but it doesn't loop. So we took that video. So there was two days of the trial. So that was the first day. The second day, and I'll tell you some more about the first day. It's hilarious. The second day we picked apart or the second morning before the trial, we picked that video apart and we found what he was talking about. And his camera is focused on my girlfriend's car. I was in my girlfriend's car at the time and uh, with her in it, of course. And we had our hazards on. And about 10 minutes in the video, you see the hazards are blanking. And then all of a sudden they go and they stay on. OK, for just a second well, longer than a second for you to catch it, right? Yeah. And then a semi goes by, a white semi, and two white pickup trucks, each of which had something sticking out of the back of the pickup truck. So very significant and you know uh, unique compared to any other white pickup truck driving down the road, right? Because it had its own cargo. So all of a sudden, a minute and a half later, the officer, oh, and, and in the video, the officer was saying, we've got a sovereign citizen, right? And then it loops a minute and a half later it plays almost a minute of that same segment he says sovereign citizen again the same three trucks drive by and the lights stopped again okay so somebody tampered with that because i had a friend with me who was a witness uh to the proceedings i had five people there mm -hmm. she spent 26 years in film producing and everything film digital and film right and she's like i'm sorry but there's no possible way that that entire frame on a glitch a minute and a half of footage can just replay like on a glitch so i haven't had the forensics done on it yet but i brought it into the court and i showed the jury and put her on the stand and of course the attorney's like well she's not a you know forensic witness so sorry she's not an expert witness mm -hmm. i'm like Dude, do you realize if this is tampered with, you just saw a crime, 
The judge just saw a crime and neither of you were concerned about it. You didn't care and they didn't. So prior to this, there's a jury of six people because it's a traffic incident. So there's a jury of six people and there are three of them are friends or related to police officers. So I've got half of a stacked jury, right? Like wow. it, it was such a joke, but we exposed so much. That was really the point. I didn't care to, I wasn't there to win. I didn't right. care about winning. I'm like, she's going to sentence me. It's fine. It's clear. She, you know, and we had a meeting before the first hearing, me, her and the prosecutor. Uh, me, the judge and the prosecutor. And at, at the private meeting, they were concerned about some things that I put into the case. Right. But but not too concerned because none of this really means anything. Oh, OK, well, we'll see when we get this to federal court, because the whole time I've been telling them this is a federal matter. You're trying to give me a charge which must run through Social Security and you're trying to charge me and you want to keep the bonds. I know how this game works. And they're like, no, oh, no, it's not what we do. Well, it's interesting because they were so, you know, bent on this bond. I kept asking them in all the little hearings up to this point, where's the bond? What's the bond doing? Oh, well, it's just a bond to make sure you show up. I go, no, it's not just a bond, judge. It's a contract. Well, it's not a contract, sir. It's a bond. I said, ma'am, I'm not sure where you went to law school. But the first definition, the first thing in the definition of a bond is it's a contract. Just look it up. I said, go on your computer, Google legal definition of bond. It, it's a contract. Yeah. You can't tell me it's that, but she refused to admit that. So then later she tells me, oh, well, you know, if you're convicted, the bond will be forfeited. In other words, you don't get your money back. Well, it's interesting how I was convicted and they gave me all my money back. Okay. <laughs> so, and they had an unclo uh, an un, uh, you know, a judge off duty in the audience who revealed himself to us later and came up and said, Oh, yeah, I'm a judge. Well, to one of the witnesses that was with, not to me, but one of the witnesses. Yeah, I'm a judge. I see this all the time. Well, then what are you doing hanging out here, uh, you know, on a Wednesday, just middle of the day when you probably should be judging? What are you doing here? You know? Yeah. yeah. So they knew that, you know, I wasn't the average Joe here, but I kept back up. Basically. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She, right. He had to. He had, I believe what happens is because not only me, but other people I've worked with and, and helped through certain situations, judges would show up, other judges would show up, make themselves known and say, well, yeah, I'm here making sure this judge doesn't really mess up. And, and the judge that was on my case had only been a judge for three years, but she's a judge of six counties. She's a chief judge of six counties, right? So this is our judicial system. This is what people yeah. are subject to every single day. There's so much that went on again. Like I said, I could take up the whole hour, hour conversation, which I don't want to do, yeah. but there was so much that was evident that, you know, and I've seen this before, but I'm trying to bring this to people's attention. You have no rights in the legal system. You can fight it. You can learn how to go into court and do all this great stuff. And people are like, Oh, you, you go in there and tell them what to do. You know, you show them who's boy. you need to learn their shit better than them. Now, how does that add up? So I'm supposed to spend all my waking hours studying, trying to be, I mean, dude, I ordered transcripts for this thing. It was 1800 bucks, right? Wow. I got to travel to Kansas. That's however much money I got to travel. Oh, so I'm supposed that that's how the system is supposed to work. Okay. So these guys that are out there teaching everybody to go in and fight, that's great. Knock yourselves out. I could tell you that that's not the way it's supposed to be, period. So what I did was made sure I documented everything. And then when she gave me my sentence and sentenced me to two weeks in jail, I wrote up a habeas corpus prior to going in. And a habeas corpus simply means that a higher court will take jurisdiction and pull me out of jail. They'll say, OK, release him because there's other issues here. So the higher court that I was going to was the federal court. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing about that is in that process, according to statute, you're supposed to appeal your judgment first at the state level and then put in a habeas corpus at the federal level, which the Fed, the feds can then say, oh, well, this is not a constitutional question or whatever. They can kick it back to you. And it's supposed to be in the district, the federal district of the state of Kansas. Well, I didn't do either of those. Because I was like, nope, this is under common law, right? Forget statute. Meaning 
because of the circumstances here, this is not statutory because it's clear that your court in Kansas and the higher court, there was a judge there. I can only believe that that judge is from the higher court and has prejudiced my right by being there, observing this case and giving this judge, you know, uh, pointers on what to do. So I'm not going to appeal this. Why would I appeal it? There's no honor here. Mm. Right. So I skipped, I negated the appeal process. And then I put it in Arizona, which is where the state is that I'm in, not Kansas's district. And my point for that was I'm in Arizona. You guys need to step up feds because this is all about the birth or the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, social security number and everything, which it is. Um, you've got tons of federal question violations going on here for a private American citizen, not a sovereign citizen. It's clear these guys were doing nothing but entrapment. So we've got problems. So I put my habeas corpus in while I was in jail and it's still sitting there. They haven't moved on it. Like they filed it and they gave it to a judge, but they haven't said anything yet. So now that I'm out of jail, I'm on unsupervised probation. Well, that's a restriction of my liberties because you have stipulations that I, I'm not allowed to do certain things because I'm on your probation. Mm -hmm. So that constitutes the right to use habeas corpus as well. So I redid my habeas corpus and I beefed it up because you got to remember, like, I didn't write this habeas corpus until the 11th hour. Like it dawned on me when I was there in Kansas the day before my trial. Shit. I better write a habeas corpus because if shit goes down and she puts me in jail for longer than, you know, a week, two weeks or whatever, you know, like this needs to be resolved. So I wrote it in contemplation of being in jail. You're supposed to write a habeas corpus after you're sentenced. I wrote in pre-sentence. So what I did was I researched the rules and I found where I could amend the petition for habeas corpus. So I amended the petition and I just sent it back in and it got there like, I think last Friday and or not this past Friday, but the one before that. And it's, again, it's been assigned. It's just sitting there, but what's in it unearths the entire scam of the police, the birth certificate, the uh, social security, all of it. Like it's all in that habeas corpus. So yeah. if they grant that, all it does is give me the power to say, clearly none of this is false because you guys granted it, right? So that's why I did this case to get me somehow in front of the federal court so I could bring these issues up. And at the same time, I said, United States, I'm doing this to protect your account because social security is not my account. I'm the holder of the account. I'm not the owner of it. You guys are the owner. And if they're, uh, you know, doing anything to uh, attach to that account, that hurts the United States debt and puts them further in debt. So I'm protecting you in this matter. So technically, I could bring this as a private attorney general and say, I'm protecting you. I was protecting your account. That's why I said I can't give you any information. And I use the constitutional protection to do that. Which is funny, it all falls under like 14th Amendment, you know, privileges and immunities type stuff. So I got a lot wrapped in this little tiny traffic ticket yeah. that's now sitting in the federal court waiting to be either accepted or denied. Well, it's been accepted, but waiting to be denied or granted. And if it's granted, it gets served on the Kansas attorney general and um, the sheriff of Kansas. Now, there's a little bit more to this, and then I'll you know, finish up. But prior to all this, before my arraignment, I gave the attorney general a birth certificate, okay, signed. Now, I've done this before, and we've done amazing things with it. Those people that say, the birth certificate is not real, it doesn't do anything, <laughs> yeah. have no clue what they're talking about. So I've already done this plenty of times. But this time, I didn't, normally what I do is I assign it a value. I give it a value. Like, hey, this certificate, uh, exchange this for, you know, 5 million, 2 million, a million, whatever the case may be. But this time I didn't do that. I just signed it. But the point is the attorney general took a state certified sealed document and never returned it. Well, wait a minute. That's a state certified sealed document. If that document meant nothing to you other than my 
registration affirming my birth, then why did you keep it? Why didn't you return it? And by the way, that's a federal document as well, because the way it runs through the system and the serial number that's on it and everything ties it into the federal system. And it's a birth certificate, not a certificate of live birth. There's right. two different ones in this country. Okay. Certificate of live birth shows you were born alive as a state, what they call national, what people are calling state nationals, American nationals, state citizen. Okay. The birth certificate is a federal citizenship certificate. Yeah, I found that on U.S. birth certificates, believe it or not. And I was like, there you go. Makes more sense, right? Hmm. So I gave them a federal certificate. So again, you know, there's a lot more detail, but I did it to expose and also to experiment to see where this goes. Yeah. And yeah. what I did when I amended it was I put a motion to seal in. Because what I want them to do is seal this case so that no one can see it publicly. So no one will be able to use this case but me. Isn't because, that bad, though? Don't you want it to be used? No, because they're never going to put it as they're never going to allow it to go through. Never. With all the yeah. shit that I'm talking about in there, state secrets, federal, they will never give me an award on that. They will just dismiss it. And I know that because I've had people that have gone in and beat cases through the court system, educating the judges all the way up. And I'm, and I'm talking like, you know, high federal appellate court, not just federal court, but the appellate court. And on gun charges, no less, a uh, guy by the name of Rod Class. I mean, Rod is an excellent, excellent law guru, if you will, from, you know, 10 years ago when I was studying. And uh, they pulled him in the back room and they said, Mr. Class, you won your case. I mean, you did a phenomenal job. But we're not going to let you win it on the public record because then everybody else could use your case and we'd have to free 80% right. of the prisoners in this country. And we're just not willing to do that. So you're going to jail or you're getting sentenced, whatever his sentence was. So my thinking is, OK, great. I'm a friend of the United States. I'm not at war with you. And I want to seal this so that, you know, I'm on your side as far as keeping it private. Because I can use that case, which means anybody that comes behind me and I work with them, I can go, hey, you know what? Here's my case. Here it is. Here's my judgment. And I will let you use this and I will help you use it. Now you can show them that even though it's sealed, it's already a done deal. So we seal your case and the next case and the next case and the next. And we just keep because look, you're making the yourself the boss, basically. <laughs> I mean, in a way, but not really my intention. It's just how I yeah. see getting this through because of all these yeah. years of watching them just shoot them down when, when you know that you're <laughs> right. But I've seen them shoot it down just because they don't want to release a precedent. Yeah. And, and, it, and then it just goes haywire, right? And then they have to overturn thousands and thousands of cases and things like that. So I'm experimenting to see, will they understand that I'm trying to protect the public from going into a frenzy and a mayhem type situation. Yeah. Because it would sink everything, which, yeah, that would be a great thing, but it would be a disaster because, you know, it would just, it would crumble before anybody knew how to handle anything. Right. Yeah. So my thinking is we do it under the radar one at a time. And I don't see too many people trying to seal their cases. Now, I don't know that they'll award my motion to seal, but you know, to me, it's the right way to go only because many, many people are not even ready to have freedom. Like they're not even ready. They're not even responsible. That's enough. true. Yeah. Yeah. They don't even want to admit that COVID isn't real. You know? Yeah. I mean, tell me about it. <laughs> right. So, so that's what's happening in Kansas. And that's why at my seminar in Arizona here, yes. uh, August 20th and 21st, I'm teaching people, look, there, there's a, few things that I want to teach people. Number one, about the legal person, what that means. So day one, I teach about the legal person. And then day two, people want to know how do I operate and still survive in the system without being of it, right? In the world, but not of it. Yeah. Well, I will show you how I do it and how we do it with our organizations that are completely unregistered, private, and we are still able to function. We're still able to bring in funds that are all donated to keep everything going. And it's nobody's business but ours. And I've got the codes that clearly say, 
no, you can't tax anything and I don't owe you any tax information. That right in the code, it says that too. So the seminar is really important to teach people like, look, I've been at this for, you know, going on 14 years and I use spiritual principles and stuff because they're protected in the law. You know, religion is protected in the law. Christianity, especially. Why is Christianity so protected in the law when it's not registered like a 501c3, for instance? That's not that's not protected because they already registered to go through all the, you know, um, they registered to submit to federal jurisdiction, to submit to federal authority. If you don't register that, there's no federal authority because the, you have a right to form a church without anybody, without anybody's authority, period. Yeah. And that's recognized. So anyway, that's what we're teaching at the seminar in Arizona here um, on the 20th and 21st. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I got to say, I've been kind of burnt out myself on the on the whole law thing. I've, you know, I've done a slew of episodes and I've I've tried to spend as much time as I can kind of dabbling in in learning it. And I, I've sent like a few notices to like a local restaurant that denied me service. And it's been so it's been so difficult finding the right resources, right, to 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 figure out, you know, how do you write this notice? How, you know, how do you, where do you go from here? And so I've gone to like the third notice, um, you know, they've defaulted on their third notice and I can't really get a lot of clear answers on where to go from here. And, and it's like, oh, well, if you fuck this up, uh, you could go to jail. <laughs> so right. like, okay, well, <laughs> uh, don't want to do that. Um, so yeah, I don't know, man. It's been like, it's been frustrating. Um, it is. It's because there's a lot of misinformation. And I'll be honest with yeah. you. One thing I did was stop listening to people on the internet. That's what I did. I stopped listening to people and I just started diving deep into the first thing I start with definitions always. Like the minute I want to know something about the law, the first thing I do is there a definition for it? What is the subject? Is there a def Okay, bam. So I go to the legal dictionary. That gives me clarity on, oh, that's what this thing is, whatever the subject might be, right? You say negotiable instruments, right? People talk about, you know, negotiable instruments and A for B and UCC and all. Okay, well, I want to know what a negotiable instrument is. So I go in, I look up negotiable instrument. Okay, great. Now I have that. And then I keep going and putting all the pieces together. But it's taking me 14 years. So I understand your frustration completely, man, because... I was at that point, you know, my first and second year in. And uh, now it's now what we're doing is trying to create something bigger so that you won't have to do that. So that people won't yeah. have to do that. If you come, if you understand that the principles of privacy and jurisdiction and where their jurisdiction starts and stops, it can become a lot easier, but you have to build something first. You have to have a yeah. group of like-minded people that all stand together. Without yeah. that, we have nothing. And that's what the House of Marcus is constantly trying to get people to understand. We're not doing processes. We're not handing out notices and affidavits and do this and do that next and trying to direct people through their cases. No, we're saying, look, here's how we start. We start with a record, we build that record, and then we all build it together. And the, the more we build it together, the more powerful it becomes. It's the same thing they did when they left England. What do you did mean that, by a record exactly? Well, without records, you don't have anything, honestly, right? Think yeah. about it. Like, what do they use against you? We got your driver's license here. We got your, uh, you know, credit card debt here. Uh, we got this. It's always a record, but mm -hmm. you don't have any records. You don't have nothing, right? You have no state documented records. So what I do is I build a public record in the county, okay? That way the county court certifies that this is out at the public at large, okay? Which is called constructive notice. My constructive notice to the world is out there. Now all I have to do is notify the attorney general, the police, whomever, and say, y'all better look at this record here before you take another step, you've been noticed. If you take a step and you breach anything that I put in that record as far as my right to property, mm -hmm. which is my body, whatever, we've got serious problems because you've already been notified and it's public record. 
It's not just, you know, me saying it. No, it's public record. I've, I've documented, I put it in the county. The county recorder has recorded it on the land records, which is super important. So the only way to do that is with a power of attorney. And people are like, well, how do you do a power of attorney from yourself to yourself? You know, because <laughs> you have to. And if you're not savvy about it, yes, you will get shot down. So again, that's what I teach people. You know, this is how I've done it. They follow what I've done. It's up to them because we don't tell anybody to do anything. We don't, you know, we don't say, do this, do that, do this, do that. I always say what I would do. And you're more than welcome to do what I would do. And as a matter of fact, my work is offered in the membership for mm -hmm. a donation. You can have my work and you can do what I do. Right. So in that and what you're doing with that is you're building a solid foundation of hundreds and hopefully thousands of people all doing the same thing. Yeah. Then when it comes time to take another big step all to everybody's uniform. Everybody's done the same exact thing and built their records. Then you take another step. You give notice and create yet another record. And you take another step. And we did this back in 2013. And that's why they came after us, because we were organized. Mm -hmm. And we were giving them notice based on the fact that we had thousands and thousands of people all over the world that were together in this group and were organized. Okay, but disorganization, when you go to some guru's website, he's like, Buy this paper, buy that paper, do this, do that. But there's no organization as to like, yeah. who's running this thing? Like, what is it? Is it an LLC? Is it a, you know, yeah. unregistered? Like, what is it? Yeah. We're building a actual society, you know. The uniformity is definitely important. And I, I mean, I certainly know great people doing this too, you know, along sure. with, with yourself. Um, but it is hard because they're, yeah, you know, they're stretched very thin and, and, um, you know, they have they have like a, a solid group, maybe. But uh, yeah, it is really hard to kind of like build that community. I think I think that that is really important. Um, but with all this stuff and, and your method, um, it, it's sort of like it's dabbling within the, the legal system, correct? No, what you're doing is you're actually when you record a document like that, you're actually lawfully acting to say, here's my declaration. Here's what I declare to the world. It's no different than a declaration of independence. Here's what I declare that I am in relation to everything. Mm -hmm. Now, you got to bring against me otherwise. And how are you going to prove that you're not me, number one? So it's not actually operating within the legal system. It's actually giving the legal system notice that you don't belong to that system. You have property that that system assumes a right over. Sure. But you're breaking that down, too. And you're saying, nope, here's where you don't have a right anymore. You know, here's where I'm drawing the line. So that's what the record is, is about. So what's the difference between doing something like that and then how other people go for like their straw man or their, um, I don't know, set of KV trust? Uh, I mean, I've been learning all these various things. Uh, I mean, what are they all just different methods or? They're all different methods. Yeah. Um, However, there is no straight and direct method to get to your assessed KV trust. There isn't. There, it's just not there. They don't, there's no statutory procedure, which means, you know, you can make one up, but that doesn't mean it's going to do anything. Now, people doing all these different processes are accessing it in certain ways, just like I do, right, in my own way. But that's not good enough. That's not a solution. That's a, oh, let's put a band-aid on it because I know how to do this, but, you know, and I could teach people, but ultimately I'm going to die. And when I die, everybody's lost because nobody knows what to do. That's not good enough. That's not a solution. Yeah. So to me, the solution is, again, everybody documents because it's all real, man, as far as like that it's actually going on. Like it's a real thing. Like, yes, yeah. they are creating a trust and they're making millions of dollars off it. And you only have a beneficial interest. In it. But where is your airship? Where is your, you know, uh, where's the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The descendant of the creator and all of that authority and rights. They'll tell you, you're a beneficiary, you're not an heir. You're a beneficiary, you're not an heir. We've had that. We've had them say that, right? Yeah. Well, if I'm not an heir, who the hell is an heir, right? I'm an yeah. heir, dude. God said, you know, you can have dominion over the earth. And Jesus said, you're co-heirs with me. Right. Everybody's co-heirs with Christ. Great. 
So where's my airship? Forget the beneficiary status. So yeah, what I do is just another way of it, but I'm also building something, a larger community that will eventually have their separation and be left alone in the financial system. Because we've already used birth certificates to just, I mean, one of our members discharged over a million dollars with the way that I have laid out my education. He's like, wow. mm, I owe you everything, man. He wants to buy me a truck. He's like, I don't buy a truck. I don't have the mortgage anymore. I got rid of my court cases, everything. Just buy what you showed me. I was like, well, that's fantastic, man. Great. But that's still not good enough. That's not good enough because it doesn't work all the time and it doesn't work across the board. And that's the other thing that I would ask anybody out there teaching. Okay, you've done this. You've done it how many times? That's great. Now, how many different situations have you done it? Okay, great. It worked then. Now, how many different courts have you? And you'll find that very rarely, if things are working, it's not 100%. It's yeah. never 100%. That's not a solution. A solution means it's over. There's no more after that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what we're working on. And I, I won't sell the farm in the public on how exactly we're doing that, but that's what we're working on, you know? So what's the ultimate goal? What's the ultimate solution? If you had a utopia, like what, what does that look like for House of Marcus? It looks like a new governance system, okay? Meaning it's not the same old Roman hmm. Republic, uh, you know, democracy, a blend of some sort or whatever. It is a complete governance system, which means there's no governing people. people. People have general rules. You treat each other the way you want to be treated, right? And, and you, you give yourself to spirit, meaning I don't give a shit about material, right? That's what Jesus said. He said, love yourself as your neighbor, treat your neighbor the way you want to be treated and love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. So to me, what that means is you are God, right? God is within you. So you need to love yourself and you need to give yourself that space. And you also need to treat your neighbor the way that you want to be treated. If we all follow those two rules, what other laws do you need? Right. So, so wouldn't the answer be natural law then no governing system? Because I mean, I, I got to say, I'm kind of a, a fan of that idea. Isn't that how it's supposed to be? No, because how can you not have a governing system? Okay, but it's what is the governing system governing, right? So think about it yeah. for a second. Hear me out and I'll explain. Okay. Think about it. Uh, just what I was saying a minute ago, people don't need governing when they know how to govern themselves. However, you still have a community of thousands of people that need to share resources. So if you don't govern the resources properly, everybody's screwed. And if you're governing the resources so that you're taking care of each other, then there's no problems there. You're not doing it for profit. Think about what they've done. They bought up everything on the earth, made you believe their scarcity, and now you have to buy from them and they have to govern you so that you get your fair share correctly under their terms and conditions, right? Mm -hmm. If you didn't have that and all you had was a governance system, like a trust, and the trustees were simply responsible for making sure your water is, you know, pure and pristine. You have food on the table. You've got a roof over your head and you've got a way to travel to and fro. Right. If they were responsible just for making sure that all those things, those basic needs were taken care of, what else would you need? And so, in other words, it's a governance system. It governs the resources for the benefit of people not the benefit okay. of some corporate conglomerate shareholder, which is all that happens now. So yeah. I'm with you on, we don't need a government because mm -hmm. we don't need a government to control us. We need a governance system. So everybody has an equal share of resources without hurting the planet. Does that make well, sense? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I think maybe like governing system is maybe like a like bad terminology to use or or maybe people would Could call be. it something different but um uh, i mean you could argue like well that that could kind of go backwards couldn't you if if those people who are governing um decided to 
you know, take advantage of, of the situation? Or, I mean, wouldn't that kind of lead us back to where we're at? Well, let's think about that. Mm -hmm. So they're not getting paid anything other than a basic salary, right? To make sure that the governance of the resources is going well. No one is selling resources for a profit. So what motive does the person governing the resources have mm -hmm. to be corrupt? Yeah. In other words, no one can come buy you out and go, hey, I don't want to pay you. Well, we don't use money. What are you talking about? We don't need money. There's no money here. We trade credits or something, you know, something to that effect for our labor. But there's no, nobody owns the resources. They're all divvied out. So what, what's the motive? Because I thought about this. I'm like, what mm -hmm. motivates people to be corrupt? Money, yeah. money, money, money. That's And I've been in behind the scenes on political um, handshake deals back before I was awake in Baltimore. And I saw, I'm like, these sons of bitches, holy shit, man, there's no law. They just buy each other out. Oh yeah, it's all dirty. Right, there's no voting. There's no, just, guys are just buying each other out. So I started to think, what motivates that corruption? Money. Well, if there's no money there other than the trade, some, like some sort of exchange for your labor, but nobody's owning all the resources. I mean, what, what motivation would there be for a trustee, if you will, over a trust governing resources to steal for themselves or to make out better than the next guy? And the other thing I thought about was you take away the motivation and you also make sure that the guidelines are clear and strict. If it's not in the benefit of the beneficiary, that is a basic trust law principle, you're out. There's hands down. And the way that I've designed how we're building it is you have trusts that oversee trusts and trusts that oversee trusts. So you don't have a manager. You don't have one person over you. You have a body of trustees over top of each other, and they all overlap and check each other. Right. Because now there's what you're trying to do is eliminate any bias and eliminate anyone that may have a self-interest by breaking it all up. And you set up trust after trust after trust after trust. And the trusts are only there to benefit the society, period. They're not there for profit and no one can come in with any money and influence anybody. OK, first off, if someone was ever caught doing that, they'd be gone. But again, we want to knock out the motivation for right. corruption anyway. So that's essentially what we're building. And I, I mean, I've had this model for a little while now, and I keep sketching it out even further when I think of something else. Oh, we're going to need that. We'll need this. We'll need that. And I keep building it out and building it out. And all those documents will be available to our society members to read, to agree to, to say, yes, I want to be part of this. And this is how I want to function. OK, great. Everybody's on the same page. It's not like, oh, hey, we got a constitution and you're part of it, right? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? I didn't sign that fucking thing. Had nothing to do with it, right? Right. So it'll never be like that. It'll be here's the way that we govern everything. Do you want to be a part of this? Yes. Okay. Bam. Do you want to be out? Yes. Okay. Bam. You're out. Then we won't bother you anymore. You're done, right? So everything has to be consensual, and that would be in your what's called your bylaws, right? So it can be done, and it will be done. It's just going to take time. So how about like criminal acts? How would that be okay. handled? Great question. A criminal act breaks what one of those two laws? Treat your brother the way you want to be treated. A criminal act has intention to harm. Oh, well, it's clear. Okay, so again, you would have a, a counsel, just like a jury, okay? And my opinion would be that person would get a few chances. Maybe call it two maybe three, whatever the society decides they think is good, right? So what I mean is your first chance is the council says you need to be rehabilitated because you clearly had the mind to hurt someone. You need to be, you've got a mental issue. That's a mental issue. When you commit a crime to hurt someone's property or someone, the, the, the one thing that they don't tell you has to be that, well, sorry, they do tell you this part. The one thing they don't tell you is a crime has to have an injury, right? That's why I said speeding is not a crime. There's no injury. There's no damage. A yeah. crime has to have injury and damage, and then it has to have intent and the actual act, right? So the act of the crime, which is called a uh, men's actus, right? And then men's ray, which is uh, the mental 
capacity to mm -hmm. harm or injure someone. That's a mental problem, right? Oh, I want to hurt you. Oh, I want to damage your property. Well, dude, you need to chill the hell out. Why would you want to do that to somebody? Well, they made me mad or whatever the case is. Well, we need to check why you got so mad over that and give you some real psychological help. We'll rehabilitate you. There's no jail. So that person would get rehabilitated by the community, by the family members, by the people that supposedly love them. Or if they don't have anybody, the community will love them back to help. You do it again, maybe you get one more chance. Maybe you don't. Maybe at that point, you're just exiled. Sorry, you're out of our, our society. Go out in the wilderness and live on your own. Go back to the other society if there's another one. But you're not welcome here. And it's that simple. Sorry, we don't operate that way. I mean, we're not going to play any games here and, you know, try to coddle you and say it's OK and charge you money and put you in a cage and let you back out and do it all over again. That's stupid. Yeah, <laughs> that doesn't work for 5000 years. Why would it ever work again? It, it won't. So that's how we would handle that situation. So crime eventually gets weeded out because people either learn if I don't straighten my shit out, I'm not going to be supported by this community anymore, period. Mm -hmm. Or they're out. It's one of the two. Now, there's also damage and injury by accident. Somebody that didn't have the thought to actually harm or injure someone. So again, that would be brought in front of a what you would call a council. I don't even want to call it a jury. I hate that word. But a council that would say, mm -hmm. yeah, you know what? We looked at this objectively and we've seen everything and all the evidence and all. And it's clear this guy did not have an intention to harm anybody. You know, any any did it by accident so now we have to help the person that was injured now we have to again the community gets behind the person that was injured and helps them and helps and these two make sure they mend their relationship it's like dude if i if i came to your house and i broke something i'd be like yo dude i just broke this man what can i do to make it right can i fix it for you can i pay to have it fixed if i don't know how to like so you and i are actually having a conversation the victim and the perpetrator, when does that ever happen? Never, right? Even in an accident, you don't get to talk to them. It's like, oh, there's was all this tension. Yeah. You know, people get angry because their shit's broken or damaged or whatever, or somebody's hurt. No, mm -hmm. you put the two together to talk about it. You'll see if there was a real intention to hurt the person, if they don't want to talk about it or, or be involved with them, right? So again, this is all psychological stuff that can be handled. It's mm -hmm. just got to be set up right. I'm definitely yeah. a fan of that aspect of like common law, um, you know, the kind of man to man working things out. Um, and I think I think that appeals to a lot of people. And I also think that we're meant to live in much smaller communities than we are, which makes it easier to kind of govern yourselves. Right. right. We're, we're now put with thousands and thousands of people like every, you know, it's it's kind of a mess. So maybe that's part of the problem. Yeah, could be. So again, like the way that I would envision it is there's one overarching set of human rules, right? Or mankind rules, if you will, for people that don't like the word human, mm -hmm. you know, and everybody lives those, which is very basic and simple. Like you don't hurt anybody. You don't have any intention to hurt anybody, mm -hmm. you know, and stay connected to who you are in your spirit, because that's going to guide you through everything. And you're going to heal those uh, psychological traumas, right? by being connected to spirit and being able to look at yourself in the mirror. So those two things are huge. So you have this overarching, yes, we all agree to be part of that, but we have our little communities that govern themselves too. And that's where the trust and the resource thing comes in, right? Mm -hmm. There's no central resource place that controls everything. Everybody gets to choose what, how they want their community to operate, you know, and everybody pitches in to do that. Even if I disagree with how the neighbor's community operates, I'm not going to go to war with you. I just disagree. And I want to live over here in this community. And we want to use our resources this way. Great. Are you harming anybody? Are you damaging the earth? Great. Hey, we're all for it. You know, I mean, that's how we, that's how I would do it. You know, I would not want the earth to be damaged or anybody to be harmed. Mm -hmm. And there's a ton of things that'll come up with that. Right. I mean, just yeah. take the, you know, the vegetarian, vegan versus, you know, meat eater thing, right? I mean, you'd have to have a community of meat eaters. Fine. They're not hurting anybody. And if there is game for them to do that, 
it's They're okay. Vicious, the vegans, man. You don't want to piss them off, though. Hell no, man. They will <laughs> take it out of you, boy. Let me tell you what. <laughs> they they don't hunt no animals, but they sure as hell do hunt some meat eaters. I'll tell you that much. Oh yeah, yeah. I get the most uh, <laughs> the the worst blowback from the the vegans and the uh, the religious people, <laughs> and then germ theory. I think. Yeah, those are the, those are the big ones. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. And then, and then the religious people, I mean, think about it. They're all just stuck in one perspective of how, you know, uh, how spirituality has been taught to them at the end of the day. Yeah. I mean, you could, you could take any religious text and apply it in relatively the same way. If you cut out all of the, this is how, this is what it means, right? Uh, you cut out all that pr previous preaching and education on what it actually means and really just apply the basic principles of it. There's no religion. They're all just talking about being connected to spirit. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I think that's that gets really lost in a, in a lot of that stuff, you know, and I've, try, I've tried to kind of impress that upon people. I've done an episode recently about religion and, you know, you don't need a book, a manual or, or any kind of like structured religion to, to have morality and, you know, to, to operate spiritually and, and be good to people. That's and, right. Yeah. So I think that's it's just unfortunate, you know, that that they're they're so synonymous. Right. Yeah, totally. And again, think about why would that even happen it, it is merely for control. Like if I can get you to believe something, I can control you by what I got you to believe. Like it's that simple. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all the books are that way, in my opinion, and all the people that preach them, you know. Right. And I again, I use the Bible because I understand it as a, as as it applies to the legal system and how the legal system was built off of those specific principles yeah. in that book. I don't look at it as a religion that everybody has to follow. You know, no, there's other religious texts out there you can follow. But I know it from my own experience in the legal system is why I use it, um, you know, in, in its pure sense, meaning its pure sense is really to just connect. And that there is no God higher than you, right? Because you are God. And that's what, like, think about it. What they do with Jesus? They created this man by the name of Jesus. And then they said, oh, he's the only one that can do this. Nobody else. In other words, you suck. You'll always suck. And don't think you'll be anything better, right? Yeah. Like, that's the religion of it. That's the brainwashing. When the man himself in their own book says, you shall do greater things than I. So instead of people looking at what is exactly documented in the book, they look at what their preacher tells them. Yeah. And it's a, right. it's a great way for people to give away their personal responsibility, right? To a, to a, oh, yeah. a, a figure or entity, whatever it is. Um, yep. And yeah, they put all, you know, it's kind of like it becomes a, a crutch in a lot of ways, I think. Oh, I agree, man. Totally. Mm -hmm. Totally. Now I was raised Catholic, so I had to overcome all of that and get into my spirituality. I mean, I was raised Catholic till about seventh grade, but my mother was the one that was like, Oh no, no, you know, we're getting into new age. Like she got in all that stuff back in like the nineties, you know, the eighties and nineties, and yeah. you know, got us all turned on to it. So I have a much, much deeper, you know, spiritual connection than any book is ever going to, you know, dictate for me how to be. You know, now I look at it all and I'm like, oh, my gosh, man, I can see why I went through that Catholic experience. So I could see <laughs> the writing on the wall and the difference between spirituality and brainwashing. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think spirituality is so much more powerful, you know, and like the more I've researched into, you know, science and like the nature of reality, you, you realize it's so much more stripped down, but so much deeper and like more beautiful, I think. When, when you figure out kind of like what the what's actually going on, you know, it's so much bigger than a book or an organized religion. Um, that's how I feel, at least. Um, totally. But I, I asked my buddy this in, in our episode and I wondered what you thought about it. Um, they definitely go hard against like Christians. Um, and of course, it's like implemented in their laws and all that stuff. Why do you why do you think they they do that? Well, again, because there's always you always have to have a war. You have to have a war, period. I mean, that's how the planet functions, right? Yeah. So that divide 
and going against the Christians and all causes this war that they need to survive. So the very asleep Christians buy into the very asleep non-Christians, calling them this, that, or the other, and they they war together. It's just so stupid. Mm-hmm. You know, I believe that that's a lot of what it is. And people don't realize who is in control of Christianity. Yeah. The Pope. <laughs> I mean, it's that simple. There was no such thing as Christianity back when Christ was on the earth because the dude wasn't going around saying, hey, I'm going to form Christianity, right? You think so, he was on the earth? Because I don't even think he was. If he was even on the earth. Was- <laughs> no, I think I think there was a man who was an yeah. extremely high influencer. Absolutely. Okay. What I think they told about him is not accurate, okay? Or what mm-hmm. they tell about him is not accurate. I think they made him out to be a superhero and a rock star. So again, so everyone else would feel like they'll never be able to achieve such a status, right? Mm -hmm. But I do believe that there was an influence or whether his name was Yeshua, you know, or Jesus. I mean, there was Buddha. There was other influencers too that were just as powerful, you know? So yes, absolutely. I do believe. But what I believe, if you just read history, it's not that hard, man. Read what happened when Rome fell or, or what happened between Rome and the middle, mid, middle ages, the medieval times. Very simple to see, man. Just look it up. Constantine, okay, was a uh, polytheist, right? Believed in polytheism. All of a sudden, they want to bring in mono. Now, this is long after this dude, whoever, Yeshua, Jesus, long after that, several hundred years. Yeah. He comes in, and all of a sudden, overnight, the guy changes into Christianity. Now, don't you think that's a little suspicious? Now, wait a minute. You had the Nicene Council, which is known for taking stuff out of the Bible and putting and putting the Bible together the way that they wanted. And then after that council, which Constantine headed up, after that council, he comes out and goes, guess what, everybody? I'm Christian now. I only believe in one God. I don't believe in many anymore. Just one. I'm good. What the hell is that? Like, yeah. So you can see that they created Christianity to hide what they do in their own um, satanic ritualistic practices that's what yeah they did. i was talking about this on my feed the other day i mean the whole like drinking the blood uh eating of the flesh or whatever right that's that's very friggin satanic right? yeah why are you Let's drinking drink blood the blood of christ and eat his body yeah that sounds like fun <laughs> it's i mean if people looked into this like really looked into it there there's really a lot of fucked up shit yeah Dude, it's like when when I was a kid in Catholic school, man, it was so eerie to me to go into the church when we had to, at, you know, during school, we'd have to go in the church and see this dude hanging on a cross with a crown with blood coming out of his head, stab wounds in him and shit, nails in his hand. And I'm thinking, what the, like, I remember being a kid going, I just don't get that. I don't understand that. Like, yeah. and that tells me now from my spiritual connectedness and intuition that what I was picking up on as a kid is that's not true. That's not true. Period. It's not fucking true. <laughs> and he did so, it on purpose. Yeah. He did it on purpose to save you <laughs> because you're such a bad person. When you're born, you're a bad person. Right. <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? God doesn't have a beard. Like, so um, what's what I realized about the Bible. So if you read the Bible as original sin being born into the material illusion reality. So forget the word sin for a moment, but know that it's being used to signify to you, you're being born into a fictional reality. Okay. And because you believe in that reality over your spiritual reality, sin, see what I mean? That's what sin is and being born into original sin, being born into the belief that this is all there is. There's only material and I have to want material in order to be happy. Yeah. It's not about being a bad person. It's about not knowing who you are. So when you are reborn, well, not reborn, because that would be, you know, but, but that reborn would be saying you came back out of the womb, but born again means that, oh, now I'm awake and spiritually connected. I'm born into the spirit. 
Again, these are concepts that the Christians will throw freaking stones at you and daggers because <laughs> that's not true. You yeah. got to say 50 Hail Marys. <laughs> you know, I you got to go to more. church every week. You can no. never be out of sin. Yeah. It's like, come on, man. Yeah, I'm going to get some. It. Read I'm going to get some. Heat. What it tells you. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Tells you a lot. Sorry. Yeah, no, I'm going to, I get you <laughs> for, for so much. Um, but you, what you were saying about the, you know, being in the physical, you can see how they've done such a, you know, a job on that to, to, to keep you disconnected from the, from the spiritual, even just in like medicine, right? Like I talk about this a lot on the podcast, like how everything is in the realm of the dead and the, and, you know, materialist science, um, they never talk about the spiritual. They never talk about any, any kind of connection to that. It's right. always like dead, dead, dead. Like we look at this dead stuff under a microscope, physical. It's all just physical. So yes. yeah, that goes along with it for me. Well, yeah. I mean, think about the Old Testament. I think I was saying this in one of my comments. You know, the Old Testament is nothing but death, war, killing, vengeance. The God is going to avenge you. Like, that, what are you talking about? That doesn't happen. You know, God is a consciousness. How is it going to take vengeance on anything? Everything is created by it. So it doesn't, no vengeance, right? So I look at it and I go, that's a different God. Clearly, that's a different God. Yeah. Now, the only time they talk about the one God is when this Jesus savior hero figure shows up in the picture, right? With his, you know, white robe on a white horse with a sword and a, Woo, I'm going to save the world, okay? <laughs> Then they talk about actually being connected to spirit, you know? So again, I do believe there was a great teacher there. Were, actually, I believe there were many great teachers, Krishna, you know, Buddha, uh, Jesus, or whoever Jesus was that were teaching, dude, be connected, be connected, be the spirit. Don't be in the material world, be in the world, but not of it. And when you read Jesus's texts in the Bible, to me, I'm like, oh my God, this makes perfect sense now. It makes perfect sense where before, you know, I was taught to believe it was all literal. It's not literal. It's metaphor. Oh, no. yeah. 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 And I look at the Jesus figure as consciousness, being awake, not even a person, the idea of being awake and how that awoken or awake person would function in a reality where everyone is caught in the material world. And when I read it from that perspective, I'm like, oh, man, everything makes perfect sense now. You know, mm -hmm. like even his apostles, he's, he, I mean, how many times do you tell him? Stop. Yeah. Ye of little faith. How many times does he say ye of little faith? You have to have more faith. Stop believing in the material world. Mm -hmm. You know, have faith. Trust in all that is because your next step is guided by something that you'll never know until you move on into another form outside of this body. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say you'll never know. You can know it if you choose to. But for people that don't have faith, it's like you don't understand that faith is simply the fact that you trust, trust, trust. It's like, dude, ever since I started trusting in the fact that whatever happens, happens, and I'm not in control, my life has completely done a 180. And that was 11 years ago, you know, and I just let go, let go, let go. It's cool. Hey, whatever's going to happen, it's for my best interest. You know, it's like when I had to buy this, or not buy, but had to rent a new house. All of a sudden, I'm at the trial, okay, that I was talking about at the beginning of our conversation. And yeah. I get an email that, oh, by the way, you got to move out by August 31st. Uh, mm -hmm. Landlord's moving back in. I had a choice. Am I going to get all pissed off and go, oh my God, now I got that. I got this trial. I might go to jail. I was like, okay, all good. Something will happen. We'll figure it out. And then once I do get to the point where now I have to look for a place, there's no places to rent anywhere. And I'm like, okay, it's all, something's going to pop. So it's all good. I looked at it. I found, finally found a place. Great. Then all of a sudden two or three places went up on the local market. And I was like, okay, mm -hmm. great. Check them out. Nothing's working. I'm like, okay, that's fine. That's because the place I found is badass, man. And it fits us perfectly. It's got everything we need. And because I was willing, I didn't jump on the first one. I started negotiating. I'm like, I'm not really feeling this place. It wasn't until I came to the place I'm at now, literally just got here yesterday. And I was like, wow. And I met the homeowners. They, you know, we clicked, they really liked me. And it was like, okay, bam, bam, bam. And all of a sudden 
in a week and a half's time, I'm now in the house. Didn't have to worry about breaking the other lease. That all worked out. Money somehow showed up where it usually wouldn't have, you know, like everything works out when you're in faith. And faith because you have to put some ag, you put some action behind it too. Always. Absolutely. That's the only thing. I don't believe in this. I'm just going to manifest all day and listen to Abraham (laughs) Hicks and everything's going to (laughs) happen. No, you have to put action in. Manifestation does not materialize without action. Yeah. Yeah. Some things might a little bit here and there, but I guarantee if you look back and you see, oh, I did put some action in. You have to take action. You have to have to have to. and do it in faith, meaning I'm going to take action and just let the chips fall where they may. It's all good. And dude, it always works out. Always, always, always. So that's the teachings that I believe in, in the Bible and in all the other books. I believe that's what is the underlying theme. Like you're a powerful creator being when you put faith into it and action into it and visualization. Sure. then yes, you will create. You know, I mean, to me, man, it's just too much stress to live any other way. I've lived that way for a long time until I finally said, no, this isn't, this doesn't work, you know? Yeah. Worrying is definitely detrimental. I I watched a video of, I think the oldest woman alive, I forget how old, but she was old. She was old as hell. And she said, they're like, what's your, what's your key? And she said, I never worry. (laughs) (laughs) That was her, that was her whole thing. Should I never worry about anything? Dude, I just lost a really good friend, man. I've been friends with this guy for like four years and we were really close. I mean, I yeah. got close with his family, all this stuff. And and the guy was like, you know, read the Bible every day, but he had no faith, none, zero. Every day it was, oh, what am I gonna do about this? Oh my God, this system, I gotta get out of this system. I gotta leave my job, I gotta do it. And I would always just be there as a shoulder, like, look, dude, I'm not gonna tell you what to do. I'll just make suggestions. You do your thing, man. I'll support you no matter what. And the dude wound up screwing me, totally just left me hang, you know, left me out to dry. And I'm like, Um, no faith, no faith. So I didn't get mad. I was like, don't need you. Well, that's alignment usually, you know, that's just you aligning. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So the more I come into alignment, the more the people who aren't in alignment move out, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And it's like, yeah. And it's a constant thing. And so many people are afraid of change alone. It's like, dude, I got over that in my teens. <laughs> yeah, I did. And that's a, that's a big thing with the, with the, you know, the law stuff too, is like, you have to be ready to change, change your mindset, be ready to leave the system. And yeah, I mean, you can't be like meek about it. And that, and there's, right. there's too many, uh, too many people not willing to, to kind of like put the energy that's required in. Very true. And they're right. They're afraid of. So the law stuff is a lifestyle change. Yeah. Period. And, and what I do see too, is I don't, well, what I don't see is a lot of people teaching that lifestyle change or being upfront about it. That look, Mm -hmm. if if you're trying to do this just to save a traffic ticket, a debt, uh, you know, a mortgage, you're not changing your lifestyle. So you will eventually suffer because your life is trying to get you or your spirit is trying to get you to see that you need to make lifestyle changes. Like how committed are you to it? And that's the thing. Like I've committed my entire life to this. That's why I don't buy property because no, that's against everything that I know because it's such a, you know, sham and it's all go- and you never own your property. It's all taken from you from signing the paperwork. So no, I'm there's not no, there's no it. way to do that without, you know, like there's no hack for that. <laughs> so they, uh, well, there might be, I just haven't spent time on it because my yeah. focus is on a solution of building an organization that's organized of people that truly want to form a new society and do, uh, or have, I should say already made life changes and will continue. Mm-hmm. So for me, that's always been my focus. I've had all of my friends and family focus on, you know, the drivers driving without licenses, mortgages, UCC, all this stuff. I was like, no, I don't. That's not me. I don't want to focus on that. I want to focus on a damn solution. I want to build something that's that will stand for hundreds of years, if not longer, like. Because to me, all that little shit you guys are doing is a band aid, and everyone that's done it all. They've either lost their home, some of them got lucky, 
and got a mortgage discharged, but even some that have gotten their mortgage discharged still got their house taken from them. Oh yeah, they still came to the house. Um, you know, I've seen people with license, you know, no license drive for, you know, five years and all of a sudden jail and then constant after that, bam, bam, bam. They wouldn't leave them alone. So they put tags in. The I mean, it's like, so again, I look at all that stuff and I'm like, yeah, those are great steps to take and very brave and great for your knowledge. But ultimately we haven't reached a solution yet because we're still fighting this shit. That's why stealing my case to me is important because if I could take someone else through, then I could take a thousand people through, then I could take a hundred thousand, then I could take a million through once I figure it out. You know, I just got to go through it to figure it out. I can't, I, I'm not one that can teach by reading something like, yes, I, I mean, dude, I've got tons of law books, which by the way, that's another suggestion. Anybody that is into the law thing, like go to a real resource, like a law book, <laughs> rather than somebody online telling you what a law book says. Cause that's kind of like the preacher that tells you what the Bible says. It's no different. Like you have to go to the resource. You have to, have to, have to. But anyway, um, shit, where was I going with that? Um, it is very, very important to make those lifestyle changes, be committed. And yes, you know, really do your homework, but do it for you, man. Do it for the bigger solution. Don't just do it for the money or for the easy, you know, don't do it so that your lifestyle stays the same because yeah. it'll never work. You know, it's either right. you do it one way or you can't serve two masters, right? It's like the Bible says, yeah. you can't serve two masters. You know, you can't try to satisfy the system and then go against it at the same time. I mean, it's two masters, you know? Yeah. So, so, so what do you have going on in, in August? You have a seminar, right? And you're going to deal with yeah. all this stuff. Yeah, well, I'm going to teach people the significance of the legal person. Of course, my experience is that's what I was saying a minute ago. Yes, I have to walk through this stuff. So my experiences and why I dispel a lot of patriot myth that's out there. Mm -hmm. And and it's really not that anybody's so wrong. It's just that no one's really telling you that, hey, this could get really bad for you. <laughs> right. Like no one's giving you that. They're just giving you paper. Anyway, so I'm teaching mm -hmm. people. Yes, how they can protect themselves with knowing more about the legal person, how to answer the legal system when it, you know, responds to you in any way, be it police officer at your door, at your car, IRS agent sending you a letter, the state sending you a letter. I teach how we can respond to that respectfully and, and get them to just go away because they don't even want to mess with you. And then the second day is you want to set something up that is really going to help society and yourself here's some ideas and here's what we've done. And again, I don't want to sell the farm on that, but because I'll, I'll get into like PMAs and why I think they're not what everybody thinks they are right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because they're, they're being fed a lot of bullshit from people that don't really have a lot of experience with them. Okay. They'll yeah. tell you they do, but a lot of people have PMA experience of, Hey, I found this on the internet here, buy this off me. Trust me. Nobody can touch you. <laughs> right. Next thing you know, Hey, it's the state, right? And then the people with the PMA are like, what do we do? And then your guru is gone and he doesn't answer the phone. So I'll be talking about why that happens and how you can avoid that and that type of thing. So there's, there's PMAs and then there's uh, private member clubs, is it too? Those They're all are, the same. They're all the same. So here's the thing. They're not even called PMAs or private clubs or whatever in the legal sense. Anybody that wants to research a PMA or a private club, look up unincorporated association. That's what it is in the legal terms, right? So if you Google that, you're gonna find a lot more legal research and uh, you know true facts of what has actually happened to these unincorporated associations in legal proceedings, rather than trying to look up private member associations, private club. Private club's not too bad. That'll give you, you'll do some good results too, but private member association, you won't find much on in terms of actual legal uh, fact and coming from a good legal resource. Mm -hmm. unincorporated association you'll find a lot on that so yes they're relatively the same thing basically what it is is it's an association of people that have not registered for anything mm -hmm. technically what it is okay and so where can people find out about signing up for that and um can you do it if you're poor 
<laughs> yeah. a, lot people, a lot of people are struggling right now. Well, that's a tough one as far as actually yeah. coming to the in-person events. So in the in-person yeah. events, we always try to do fellowship too. Like we have a yeah. VIP dinner so that we can have dinner together uh, with, with only the first 40 people because any more than that is too chaotic and I can't talk to everybody. But after the dinner, we invite everybody to come dance. We have a band, people come and sing and have a good time. Now, if you don't have that kind of money and of course you can't get to Arizona or you don't live here, then we do offer the live stream, which is 50 bucks. So it's two days of education. It's 12 hours of education for 50 bucks. So it's a pretty good deal. Um, and, and yes, it'll be recorded. So if you do miss it, you'll have access to it. It's not like, Oh, I missed it. You know, or, or if you can't watch all 12 hours, you know, both days, six, both days, then it'll be recorded and people can go to uh, house of Marcus, M A R K U S dot org. And then, go to our events page and you'll click on that or uh is it news news or events and you'll see the events click on it right at the top of the page is the biggest um you know advertisement there if you will biggest event advertisement is that one so you just click on that now you will have to sign up on the website as a user there's no fee what that means is we have you sign our terms and conditions we do need people to sign an nda that's what it is because Without an NDA, there's not a level of privacy there and I can get in a lot of shit. So right. uh, I don't need that. And so we ask people to sign an NDA. We're not looking to come after anybody. We're just looking to protect our butts from you know who that's always got their eye on things. Mm -hmm. So um, so you become a user. It walks you through that when you go to buy the tickets. Very easy. Just a couple simple steps. And then, yeah, you could buy the live seminar or come in person. I mean, we'd love to see people in person because the events are awesome. We've already done three of them and we've always had a great time with everybody. So yeah. fellowship is really a big, big deal to us. You know? well, sounds awesome. If I was in the area, I would definitely, I would definitely show up. Um, so yeah, man, yeah. we're going to get you out here. Oh <laughs> man, you never know. I got to go somewhere. So <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> But um, yeah, thanks, man. Thanks for coming by again. It's been uh, a great talk. So I, I appreciate it as always. And I hope people check out your stuff. Thank you, man. I definitely appreciate you having me on. And, and I always love having conversations with you. And I do appreciate your very open mind and, you know, unbiased, man. I really appreciate that. Oh, so thank, thank you. you. Sure. All right. The information presented in this program is not intended as legal, health, or nutritional advice. It is provided for informational purposes only. Alight On does not endorse nor accept responsibility for any statements, views, or opinions expressed by its guests.